Hey, hey everybody, I hope you're doing well today. This video is going to take a look at the protectionist subsidy diagram and how a government might use a subsidy, a protectionist subsidy, to protect its own consumers from the imports of other products and international competition. So take a look at this video. I hope you find it helpful. Well, this video will talk about what happens when the government intervenes in a protectionist way and provides a subsidy, in this case, to U.S. Uh, wheat producers um, in the U.S. market. First, I think it's important to take a look at the domestic, and that should say, of course, say world market for wheat before the U.S. opens its market up to um, international, international producers. So it's very simple, right? Here's a domestic supply curve. Here is a the domestic demand curve, and of course there's an equilibrium point established at PE and a quantity of QE. Once, and therefore, if you take this, the area of this, this rectangle here, right, the area of this rectangle would be equal to the total revenue generated by domestic producers of wheat, right? The price times the quantity will give you the total revenue of domestic producers of wheat. But once the United States opens itself up to the world market, you can see what happens. The, the amount of U.S. producers who can participate in the, the, the market for wheat, these producers have all been cut out of the marketplace. Why? Because they're not competitive at a price point of PW. And only these producers in the U.S. can still participate and sell their wheat in the market because they can turn a profit. So as a result of this, the, the opening up of the U.S. market to the world producers of wheat, U.S. domestic uh, producers revenue has dropped um, from PE to Q, P P e Q e to PWQ1. So the quantity Q1 is the quantity of wheat that will be produced by U.S. producers or domestic producers. Okay? What about the rest of it? Well, as a result of the dropping in price, of course, there's a massive increase in consumer surplus because the new price point is PW, and producers on the world, world producers will produce the quantity um, Q1 to Q2, which is the difference between um, the total revenue generated, PWQ2, and the part that will be uh, produced by U.S. producers. So foreign revenue is this area of the Q1, PWQ2, this big rectangle right here, will be um, the total revenue of foreign producers before the subsidy is included. But you might imagine, you know, the United States government might have an incentive to try to get some of these people, these, these producers who've been cut out of the marketplace, back in the game. And one of the ways they could do that to impose a subsidy, or not impose, but to give a subsidy to U.S. producers of wheat. And therefore, we can see that what's going to happen is the following diagram. Okay? One thing that's important to point out is that in the market, the price, even though there's a subsidy, the price is still at PW, and therefore the demand remains at Q2. So there's not a change of price. When a subsidy gets involved, there's not a change in price. Q2 will still be demanded in the marketplace. It's, but what's going to change is the quantity of producers or the amount of wheat that is going to be produced by domestic producers as opposed to foreign producers, okay? So domestic producers, as a result of the subsidy, would increase their production out from Q1 to Q3 because they are now receiving the price of PW plus the subsidy, okay? This subsidy is allowing this quantity of producers to participate in the marketplace, this means that the revenue for domestic producers goes from A, remember this is A right here, goes from A to, check it out, A plus B, which is obvious, right, because they're producing Q3 quantity in the marketplace, but also because of the subsidy, their revenue would go up the, with the addition of G plus A, F plus E. So total domestic revenue went from just A to A plus B plus E plus F plus G because the government is providing the subsidy and all of this will be considered revenue for domestic producers. Foreign producers, of course, will supply the rest of the wheat to the market, which is the difference between Q3 and Q2, and bef which 
and thus their revenue falls from B, C, D, B plus C plus D, right? Remember, before they were producing Q1 to Q2. Now with the quota, they are no longer producing B, but only producing from Q3 to Q2, which means their revenues will fall from B plus C plus D before the, before the subsidy to simply C plus D after the subsidy. And don't forget that the government pays the subsidy, which would be shown by, and you should be able to see this pretty quickly, E plus F plus G. So the subsidy is this big box right here, right? E plus F plus G. And this is the amount the government's going to have to pay in order to get all of these producers that have been cut out of the marketplace back in the game and, in theory, help the U.S. market for wheat. Okay, so how do we look at this? Well, there's one other thing we have to take a look at. Um, Q1, Q3 tons of wheat are now produced, right? Now, what about this G, right? This is the thing. We know that this is going to be some sort of deadweight loss. But why is it a deadweight loss? Well, G is a deadweight loss because Q1, Q3 tons of wheat are now produced by relatively inefficient domestic farmers, right, as opposed to more efficient foreign farmers. Remember, foreign farmers were producing this at a price of P, W. But now, this Q1 to Q3 is being produced by in, uh, relatively inefficient domestic producers as a result of the price level going from P, W plus the subsidy. So G represents a loss of welfare. Okay? The, foreign, the foreign producers would produce this quantity for a minimum revenue of B, whereas the domestic producers need a, a revenue of B, plus G, okay? Thus, G represents the inefficiency of the domestic producers and a misallocation of the world's resources since more of the world's resources are being used to produce the wheat than are necessary. And therefore, this is another example of a deadweight loss. So you've got to pay attention on that one. That is a really, um, this deadweight loss right here is something that you really got to think about because it kind of shows up in a very odd portion of the graph. Okay. The other interesting thing to note about this, and I mentioned it earlier, earlier, is that there's no loss of consumer surplus, right? Because the price of um, the price, the quantity rather, because the price of the wheat doesn't change. The price actually in the marketplace is still PW. However, consumers are indirectly affected as the governments will use tax revenues to fund these subsidies. So there's no loss of consumer revenue because Q2 is still being. Uh, purchased in the marketplace. It's just that those who are producing it has shifted um, from foreign producers who are much more efficient than the domestic producers in the United States. So in the end, this subsidy, of course, is going to have to be paid for, and this may mean higher tax payments that also involves an opportunity cost in terms of reduced government spending on other things. Okay, so I hope you found this video to be helpful, and we'll talk to you in a bit. Important thing really is you can take all of this and, and make it and, and make it turn into something. Okay, so check this out. What I'd like you to do is this is a good way of working on the, the, the idea that we just talked about is to draw your own copy of the subsidy diagram with cotton in the US as the example. Make a table with two columns, one headed winners and one headed losers. In each column, make a list of the stakeholders who win or lose by the granting of a subsidy and give a brief explanation in each case of why the stakeholder is either a winner or a loser. And be sure to consider possible international implications. Use the letters in the diagram to specifically identify the costs and the benefits. And this is giving you the practice of actually using that diagram.